to use the study of? Meteors. Weather, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can sort of see how we've done landforms, we've done like outside and space, the cosmos, but landforms, but weather. It's a pretty comprehensive deal actually. This is why there are so many stories. Each story, do you get it? There's a bit of a, each chart, there's a bit of a story to go with it. Meteorology. Well, so you know when you look at this chart what you're looking at, not yet, but you will. The top of the mountain, the sun, gives energy down to the land below. Can you see that the layers of atmosphere are quite dense, closer to sea level? And at the top, it's quite sparse. And this is why when you climb a mountain, there's not so much oxygen around, a very tall mountain, it's very thin air. And my sister tells me that at the top of Mount Everest, she gets, um, she gets uh, altitude sickness a lot. So I say, Jen, why do you want to be a mountaineer again? <laughs> but basically, your brain dies. When you go up there, your brain is dying. So Jen, two or three of the mountains, she's climbed the tallest mountain on each continent, and two or three times she's had to do it a couple of, try a couple of times because she just gets so sick because there's not enough oxygen, and you can see that it's more condensed here. However, the sun doesn't, the energy doesn't have to go through so much, but what it does do is it comes this way. The next chart shows what happens to the sun's energy. The sun's energy goes down, but it bounces off the earth, and sometimes it bounces back off the layers of atmosphere and goes back down, okay? This is called the greenhouse effect. The sunlight comes in and bounces up and some of it gets reflected all the way out of space, but some of it gets bounced back by the atmosphere. And the more thick you have as atmosphere, the more the greenhouse effect works. So the energy keeps bouncing, bouncing, bouncing up to the um, clouds and down and up and down. And that's what we have as uh, global warming as well. When you have mentee, this is you here, or this is this us people, this us and the planet, it's a person lying, you know that we're getting warmed from beneath us. Remember that there's a heat source under the planet. In fact, in Finland, they have too much energy. All houses are just heated, you just need to put a house on the ground and it'll be warm, because there's more, has any guys ever been? It's so cool, and it just there's so much warmth, and they, they actually export energy. They think, well, how can we get rid of all that energy? We've got too much energy. They don't need um, nuclear, they don't need hydro, it's just so much energy there, and it keeps them warm. So we've got this heat coming through here. The cold from interstellar space comes down and settles on the planet, but we can keep nice and warm if we have lots of layers of atmosphere to keep us, to insulate us. You remember when you put on a duvet, it isn't the duvet that keeps you warm. It's your body that keeps you warm. But the body, your body heat is trapped by the layers of the duvet and therefore your heat is conserved. But the duvet does not make you warm. Okay? It's the heat from your body that traps that makes it feel warm. Because you pump out a lot of heat. If you were the size of a crocodile, or if a crocodile were the size of you, the crocodile eats one ninetieth the amount of energy that you eat. A very, very little amount of energy. Because we spend 90 times more energy keeping ourselves warm than the crocodile does. The crocodile can't keep themselves warm, they don't have any ability. They have to sit there in the sun until it gets hot, and then when the sun's warm enough, they can move around. When the sun goes away, they have to stop until the sun comes again. But we're mammals, and we can be warm because of the energy we're there. <coughs> Do you understand that about the duvet? A lot of people think that duvets get you warm. But duvets are good insulators. It's you that gets you warm. But if there's not a lot of layers of atmosphere, i.e. at the top of a mountain where it's thin layers, it's cold because it's, there's not many layers of atmosphere to keep us warm. West Coast people will understand this. The rain 
moves around, or whether it generally moves around the world in one direction, is the Coriolis effect, which means that the Earth is spinning one way, and the weather is just a little bit of out of sync. It doesn't keep, can't keep up. Because if it was a rigid mass, then it would stay um, geostationary, i.e. in the same place as the Earth, but the weather is an atmosphere is like a bubble sitting above, and when the Earth rotates, the, the weather, or the atmosphere, stays back a little bit behind. So we always get our weather, or most of our weather comes from Australia, right? Because the Earth is coming this way, and so the Earth is there. When the weather rain, when the clouds come and they bump into a really tall mountain, They've got nowhere to go, so they hang around here for a bit, but then heaps of clouds are bumping them, so after a while they have to go up if there's a long wind. But when they, a, a rain cloud holds onto a lot of water, but it can't carry that amount of water when it gets cold, and we know that going up makes the clouds cold. So it has to drop all of the rain on this side. If you can see some dots up here, this is mm. the clouds dropping all of the rain. So it really rains a lot on this side, but it doesn't rain a lot on this side, on the west coast of New Zealand. Eight metres of rain annual rainfall. Eight metres. Being down the west coast, you understand that that's an enormous amount of rain. So, this is when it gets a little bit complicated, but it's really cool. It's very nice to know. The sun heats up this area of the planet about its closest, right? So we know that hot air rises, okay? Heats, the sun heats the land, the land heats the air, the air rises up. So we start to feel that this air is going up. Now, you can't have a vacuum in nature, you can't have nothing there. So if all of this air is gone, what's gonna happen is that this air rushes in, okay? By heating up this area, hot air rises, and the air that's either side will rush in, okay? This is called a low pressure. Can you see why? Because, sorry, this is a, well, I want to talk about how pressure, low pressure, and enough for the other charts. Pressure's going up here, it's hot, the wind is coming in here. What does all of this wind air do? It's come up here, but there's more air coming in underneath it, so it has to go back around. When it goes back away from the sun, it starts to get cooler and cooler and cooler. So, hot air comes up, cold air rushes in to, to replace it. This air now has is displaced, falls back down to the north and south pole, and it creates this cycle of wind. Does this make sense? So, um, hot air, the heat comes down. So the hot rises, it gets pushed out by the cold air coming in, and ultimately the hot air gets cold, sinks down, and then is sucked around again and again and again. Okay? That's the simple version. Here you can start to see this is the equator. This is the pole. The sun is falling on this area of the equator, we understand that. So therefore we see the hot air rising. It goes out. And then when it gets to the pole, it gets cold and it sinks. And then it's sucked in again because this is taking all the hot air out, so the air comes out. Mm. We start to get these sorts of weather patterns. Get very complicated. Hot air from the equator goes up, but it sinks down about at this point here, which is called the doldrums. Boom, boom. Doldrums are areas where there's not much wind. And if you're sailing, in doldrums, then you can't um, move forward, and actually all your horses die, which is awkward because you really need the horses, which is why you put them on the boat in the first place. So a horse wind is a wind that um, there's just no wind there, and the doldrums are examples. So, which one heats up quicker, liquid or land? Liquid or solid? Which one absorbs the temperature quicker? If you put toast, put jam on to tomato on toast into a uh, oven, 
Which one's going to get hot quicker, the tomato or the bread? The tomato. The tomato, because the liquid will heat up much, much quicker. Mm. But when you take it out, which will get colder quicker? The tomato. The liquid is able to accept and release heat faster than a solid. Okay? A solid takes a long time to get hot, but then it takes a long time to get cold. That is that why sense? tomatoes are so much hotter on everything? I yeah. feel like I always burn my tongue. <laughs> well, tomatoes. they're hotter closer to the time you take them out of the oven, but they're yeah. colder a little bit later. Mm. I think of like the tar roads on a really hot day, like when the sun has set, the roads are still quite hot. Mm. Mm. Yes, because the land will retain the heat. Mm. The latent heat <laughs> capacity of land is greater than the latent heat capacity of water. Is it because of what it's made of? No, it's not the con not the matter, it's the density of the matter. Okay. If you're a liquid, then you can get hot, you can take on a lot of energy really quickly because heat is just the measure of the average speed of those particles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It can start moving around a lot faster, that means hotter. Oh right? yes, okay, that makes and sense. Then they can go down. It doesn't matter what the, the substance is, it's just what state it's in. Having said that, there are different lat latent heat capacities. All materials have got different latent heat capacities, i.e. how much energy they can take on, how mm. quickly. That's what latent heat capacity is. Make sense? Yes. Cool. So, water, land, hot. When it's day, I've heated up the land. So this is probably evening now. I've heated the land. The land is letting off the heat and the air comes in from the sea onto the land, okay? Sometimes in the day. If I heat up the water, then the water will get warm, the air will rise, but if the land is still cold, you'll see the winds go mm. in the opposite direction, which is what we're going to look at. Here, Sun heats the water, temperature rises, gas comes off, land is colder, but this air is rising, so we're going to see the wind come offshore on, and onshore winds are to do with the relative heat capacities of land and water. Okay, so that's why you can tell if you're out sailing, you can't see the land. When it gets the temperature drops, you see which way the wind blowing, and you know where the land is because of this. So, air comes along, hot air comes along off the sea, bumps into land mass, has to do a U-turn, gets colder, can't carry the water, drops a whole lot of rain. When you see cliffs, you have much more extreme weather. Sun heats up the water, the energy comes off the water. Okay? land, the energy is going to be slower, it's faster in the water. When it gets cold again, then you start to see the it raining over the land. And if you've ever been on a tropical island, it rains all the time in the evenings, i.e. the water, air, the hot air over the water has picked up all the water, and then it's, when it's sitting over the land, the land cools, so mm. it cools it down and it rains. This shows us the different climes, and we're not going to do a study this time, but you can actually do a different climes of where people come from. I'll show you some charts in a minute. This is the tropical zone, and these are temperate zones, and this is a subtropical zone down here. It's how hot each area of the world is. And here we have the northern zone and the southern zone. The poles. It's ice on the boat. Well, in the future, we won't be able to say there's ice in the Antarctica. And the Arctic. Antarctic, ant means opposite. Arctic, Antarctic. Antarctic, we call it. Asia is in the northern hemisphere. The word for south is Austral. So we live in Austral Asia, which just means South Asia. What's that? Oh, my mind just got blown. 
<laughs> south frigid, south temperate, tropical. These are the zones of where we live. Here they are again. You can see where the sun is here, it's hottest, and it gets coolest. Now, in New Zealand, with the rest of the world hanging around, <laughs> helps us to see where the equator is here. You see how most of land mass is above the equator? This line here is the equator. Hmm. Most of it. And so there's very little land mass underneath. There's Australia, bottom third of Africa, and South America are the only sort of big bumps that happen. Whereas those guys get Asia and North America and Europe. There is, of course, Antarctica down here as a land mass. And then these here. This is the southernmost point at which the sun will come up 90 degrees above you, straight above you, and that's 27 degrees because that's the tilt of the earth. This is the point here. So you can see, let's say this dotted line, can you see the dotted line now? New Zealand's a little bit under the dotted line, all right? So we're closer to the pole than the dotted line. But let's have a look at here where Europe is. Europe is a lot closer to the pole than New Zealand is. Yep. In fact, possibly the tip of Spain is about the same place as Auckland. Can you see that in terms of how far off the dotted line? This is really a cold, dark, wet place. Hey, it is. We went up 32 degrees in Brighton. Oh, too hot. Periodic table of elements, which you need to understand how to put together, but that has come up under chemistry. Do you all remember valence? Do you all remember how to put it together? 